So now this is going to be affiliated with your But we are reporting. I think it's how we think. I think I made the numbers. <laughs> Anything else This is how I know. Yeah, so we're doing like, so it's I'm like, 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 I'm like,
Alessandro was really kind enough to bring a uh, scan QR codes for a discount on his book. So if you want one, please pick it up at the end of the talk. And yeah, I think that's 30% off. That's pretty good. That's right, yeah. So is it right here? Okay. Now hopefully we'll get started. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I passed them out. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I don't have a copy for display, but I ran out of copies and yeah, they didn't get yeah. there on time. They're in color, which I think is a huge plus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't believe you didn't bring your own copy for display. I know. <laughs> yeah. And I have one. I have one now. And it's just yeah, like crazy. You don't have any copies yet? Hmm? You don't have any copies yet? Yeah, they gave me long ones, but I yeah. picked yeah. them out. Yeah. And now I. So they were sending me a second batch. Yeah. They send them from the US to the UK. Yeah, it's forever. And it's like office in London, but for some reason they always send them. Like, yeah. 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 Does he also have a different cover? No, it's not. It's yeah, same exactly. And I don't think it even changed. Like, I don't know if you want to show this person. Like, yeah. No, it's too late. Because a lot of times it's like, you can do it. You can do all the stuff. No. And they just come in. Yeah, they're costing you. Yeah, they're costing you. I'll grab one voice. Yeah. 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 Yeah
work on kind of a Soviet Union history in Ghana, Guinea, and Mali. And I'm really excited to hear about this and kind of the Soviet Union terms in Africa. So please join me in giving her a round of a hand, a round of applause, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. And um, yeah, Chris is on the way, so you'll know, comment uh, on, on, on my, uh, my book, I guess, uh, after, after my talk. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, for, for inviting me, I'm very glad, uh, happy to be here. It will talk about yeah the book, uh, Reset Development, which came out very recently. Uh, what I'd like to do with you today is talk about small development and and particularly the, the Soviet idea or the model of development, uh, which the Soviet government attempted to uh, export. Uh, to three countries in West Africa between the mid 1950s and the late 1960s. Um, the, the sort of broader goal of the presentation and the book um, is to reflect on the, on the role of the Soviet Union uh, in the history of development and economic modernization. Did you call it this? Sorry? Did you call it this? No, I think I was. Are oh, you good? Oh. Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the, the place of the Soviet Union in the history of, of development and economic modernization um, in the second half of the, the 20th century. Um, so, very good. Uh, the, the, the <laughs> we have a frenzy today, which yeah. I think is yeah. very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I hope yeah. it's not going to give you sort of motion sickness. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So the, the starting point of the, of the story, of my story, is West Africa um, in the mid-1950s uh, as the history of development in what today we tend to call the Global South, uh, back in the day, uh, what being called uh, Third War, it's more likely. Um, well, the history of development is deeply intertwined uh, with the history of, of decolonization um, in, in the Third War in the Global South. Uh, and between 1957 and 1960, Ghana, Guinea, and Mali became among the very first territories to become independent uh, from European empires in, in Africa. Um, all three achieved independence uh, under the guidance uh, of charismatic, uh, visionary, and, and radical uh, leaders. Give you a quick tour. Uh, that was Kwame Kruma in Ghana, uh, Ahmed Sekoutoure in Guinea, and Modibo Dejao 
Mali. Um, now, the three countries are profoundly weird and still are profoundly different uh, from, from all points of view. And the three people uh, in power at the movement of independence also wear very different politicians, leaders, and individuals in terms of background, uh, political outlook, and ideas about the world. Um, they did have uh, some common traits, however, and specifically, all three, and Kruma, uh, and Kika, were believers in development, in, in economic development, uh, in the necessity for their newly independent countries um, to obtain development um, as quickly as possible. That's because political independence, uh, uh, which is what countries had achieved, uh, constitutional independence uh, was only the first step uh, toward the achievement of real independence, which required, crucially, economic independence as well. So to be truly free, Ghana, Guinea, and Mali, they needed to cut the dependency links that still tied them to the, to the former colonial powers. Uh, so England, in the case of Ghana, and France, in the case of both Guinea and, and Mali. Um, they were in the late 1950s, uh, uh, when they obtained independence, they were still very reliant uh, on capital and technology that came from the former colonial powers. Now, at this moment in time, uh, uh, the mid to late 1950s, if you're interested in uh, economic development, uh, there is one obvious place to look at, um, and that's the Soviet Union which might sound uh, maybe surprising from, from the point of view of uh, listeners in, in the 2020s. Uh, but things were very different uh, in, in the 50s, especially. Uh, the early years of the uh, Nikita Khrushchev um, era. Um, this moment in time, the Soviet economy uh, was performing, had been performing incredibly well uh, for about a decade, um, if, not, if not more. Uh, in fact, outperforming in terms of uh, sort of GDP growth rates, most economies um, in, in the West. Um, now, I know that numbers are always very tricky, uh, perhaps especially when talking about the Soviet economy. Uh, so I don't want to rely uh, on, on numbers and sort of figures too much uh, um, to talk about this idea, uh, um, I'll, I'll rely on something else, uh, which is the image that the idea uh, of, the, of the Soviet Union as a prosperous country, as a modern economy, uh, uh, with very fast growth rates and remarkable uh, technological and scientific um, achievements. Um, so of course, uh, this, is a, this is a picture of Khrushchev, uh, uh, the admiring American corn, famously. Um, but in the mid-1950s, uh, the Soviet government, the EDIC, um, had just launched a very ambitious program to, to cultivate uh, corn on previously a sort of barren land. It was called uh, the, the Virgin Lands Campaign, heard of it. Uh, and for the first few years, uh, Soviet agriculture uh, actually uh, produced uh, record harvests. Things became complicated later on. Uh, for a while, Soviet agriculture seemed at the edge of what was possible in terms of technology and production. And there was more, uh, of course. Think about Sputnik, of course, uh, the first artificial satellite uh, that was launched uh, in October 1957, which is just a few months after Ghana had become independent uh, in, in March. Uh, a few years later, uh, the Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human being to travel to travel in space. Now, the Soviet successes in the space race, they, they um, posed a lot of anxiety, maybe even soul searching in the West, Sputnik movement, and so on. But they also posed a lot of generated a lot of interest. Um, in the Soviet Union, in its science, in its technology, in its economy, uh, uh, around uh, the global south, including, of course, in West Africa. 
uh, probably even more than space, um, it was things both of the art uh, to inspire the first post-colonial government uh, in Africa and West Africa even more. Um, some Soviet projects um, like Bratsk, for example, really captured uh, the imagination of, of leaders like Kruma, like Sekutore, like Pita, and, and many more around the world. So in 1954, the Soviet government uh, began the construction of the Bratsk Dam uh, on the river Angara in eastern Siberia. Um, and the dam was supposed to be huge, uh, colossal. Um, at the time, it was the largest one in the world. Uh, and uh, the, the hydroelectric power complex that was sort of attached to the dam uh, at the time was also one of the largest ones in the world in terms of production of hydro, hydroelectric power. So projects like the, the dam at Bratsk uh, were exactly what the new governments in Ghana, in Guinea, and in Mali hoped to realize a home uh, in their own countries. Um, and for this reason, they looked at the Soviet Union uh, for help, uh, for inspiration, and also for practical uh, cooperation, technical, scientific, economic. The new West African leadership hoped to obtain from the Soviet Union advice on how to organize collective farms, help to identify the best tools and machines to use in agriculture and industry, um, assistance in establishing things like uh, workshops, uh, small scale factories, help to build irrigation systems, uh, transport, energy infrastructure, and so on. Compared to the West, the Soviet Union at the time really seemed to have something more, uh, not only the specific technical knowledge and how to make, how to produce these things, but also the promise to be able to achieve them, to realize them in practice uh, much more quickly. And as the Soviet leadership and one of the sort of founding myths of the Soviet Union uh, maintained rapid development in the space of one generation alone, uh, as Nkrumah, the Prime Minister of Ghana, said. And all three, all three leaders in West Africa, they believed that socialism, uh, and, and specifically the Soviet approach to socialism, uh, offered uh, the best prospects uh, for, for rapid economic development. Uh, they were ready to experiment with it, to give it a chance. And the Soviet leadership at the time was uh, uh, more than happy to, to help Khrushchev and his allies in government, well, they really, uh, they're pretty really convinced that the Soviet Union had achieved a level of uh, economic development um, sufficient to, to help others uh, to put in practice some of the same ideas and lessons uh, abroad uh, as well as at home. And so between 1958 uh, and 1960, the Soviet government signed uh, comprehensive uh, cooperation agreements uh, uh, with Ghana, with Guinea, and with Mali. Now, when I say comprehensive, I, I really mean it, uh, because all three sort of international treaties they established uh, the Soviet Union in terms of, uh, sort of capital, people, and expertise would be present at all levels of economic life uh, in the three, three countries. First of all, the Soviet government committed uh, uh, to providing uh, in Mali uh, with large loans of financial capital, uh, of money, in the, in the region of uh, uh, 120, 150 uh, million US dollars. Those are 1960s million dollars, uh, a, lot, a lot more in, in today's terms, uh, to realize project, to finance projects in infrastructure, in agriculture, and in light industry. Moreover, the Soviet Union would also send uh, advisors and technicians uh, uh, to, to sort of assist uh, with, the, with the pursuit of those projects on the ground uh, in Ghana and Mali. So the projects would not only be financed by Soviet money, uh, they would also be uh, supervised uh, by Soviet experts, uh, agronomists, economists, engineers, and so on. 
Um, so the, the agreements in short established that the Soviet Union would uh, cover most of the development deal uh, in Ghana and Guinea and Mali, uh, and that Soviet personnel would be involved uh, at pretty much all levels of its search for economic uh, development, from building railways and roads to advising uh, how to manage the money supply uh, in newly established central banks, uh, from helping to organize uh, uh, commercial exchanges with other countries to surveying the soil, uh, searching for precious metals, oil, and, and so on. And that's what I'd like to focus on uh, now, uh, uh, so to analyze, reflect on the, the Soviet model of development in West Africa, of course, and its many problems. That this is not a happy ending story, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm going to follow uh, very briefly uh, three separate projects, um, one per country uh, and one in infrastructure, one in agriculture, uh, one in industry, uh, to talk about, to think about what the ambition was, uh, what kind of approach was taken in practice, and what went wrong uh, with them in the end. The common friend in all three projects I'm going to focus on, or in general, um, was the search for economic independence. The long term objective of both Soviet and West African specialists uh, was to reduce the necessity to rely on resources that came from abroad. More of that in a moment. So I'll start from Guinea, uh, which is, uh, uh, was the first country. Uh, chronologically to sign uh, a cooperation agreement uh, with the Soviet Union. In 1959, when the agreement was signed, um, Guinea was considered, uh, was talked about as a, a poor country. Um, it had a population, one of the poorest in Africa, in fact. Um, it had a population of about 3 million people uh, at the time of independence. Quick comparison, the city of Moscow in 1960 had about 5 million people. Um, so it was a fairly small country in terms of population. Uh, more than 80% of people in Guinea at the time uh, of working agriculture, uh, and over 90% of them uh, were employed in what people usually call subsistence agriculture, uh, meaning that they survived uh, thanks to the, to the basic crops that they could grow themselves. Uh, the, the Soviet economists that studied the country and wrote reports in them uh, used to say that there was no surplus in the country using sort of classic Marxist technology. Everything else had to be imported uh, from, from outside. Uh, so everything you see in those photographs had to come from somewhere else, usually from France. Uh, shoes, clothes, furniture, tools, uh, also any kind of processed food, uh, all kinds of medicines, uh, most means of transportation, bicycles, cars, boats, and all types of fuel, all of these things that have to come from a different country. Um, and energy, and, and particularly electricity, was an especially difficult, challenging problem uh, for the Guinean government, the Secretary of government. Uh, Guinea at the time relied on a few sort of diesel powered generators uh, in the urban centers to produce some electricity, uh, but that was not enough to power the whole country uh, outside of the capital, Conakry, and a couple of other places. And Sekutove uh, wanted this to change. Whatever construction project you have in mind, whatever development idea you, you may have, it's impossible to realize it without a reliable, stable source of energy of some kind. And so the Soviet advisors and their Guinean colleagues immediately agreed uh, that Guinea needed a reliable source of energy to power up machines uh, 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 and, and equipment for construction, and also, of course, to bring electric light uh, to communities. They also agreed that the best way to produce electricity in the country uh, um, was through a, a large dam with a hydroelectric power station attached. Uh, the shots boasted about Soviet, the Soviet ability uh, to build 
to build dams. Uh, Soviet engineers had plenty of experience uh, in this field. Uh, and Sekutovay wanted a dam to be built with Soviet funds and also following Soviet ideas as a work of infrastructure, but also as a symbol of a new independent country able to stand on its own feet. In 1960, the dam project started. Um, studying at the geography of the country, Soviet and Indian engineers, uh, they recommended uh, uh, building uh, 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 the power station, a dam and a power station on the, on the Konkure River. It doesn't exactly look like that. It's, uh, it's an impression to give you an idea of roughly uh, uh, where it is. Uh, um, why, why the Conqueré uh, River? Uh, um, well, because uh, it's, it's uh, well positioned uh, to provide electricity to the entire sort of Western portion of the country, which is where most of the population lived. And, and that's also where the capital city uh, is located on the coast, you see it. Um, you see. Um, moreover, um, studying the sort of flow of the river, Soviet Indian engineers concluded that the best place uh, to put a dam, a power station, to exploit the power of the river would be relatively close to the headwaters uh, where, the, where the sources of the river are. Um, a sufficiently powerful power station in this location would have been able to supply electricity to the entire western portion of the country. Um, and in theoretical terms and abstract terms, this wasn't uh, a bad idea. Everyone agreed that Guinea needed a source of energy and making Guinea self-sufficient from the energy point of view could be the first step to realize more ambitious projects. Uh, it was the idea of economic independence that guided uh, Soviet Union cooperation. So, so far, so good on paper, uh, uh, but things uh, became much more complicated uh, soon. So the initial part of this river, the Conqueré, uh, is in the region of Guinea uh, that's called the Futajalon. It's very, very beautiful uh, with, with sort of densely, densely forested and peaks of uh, about 1,500 meters. Uh, very, very beautiful for sure, but also incredibly challenging as a place in which to build anything, let alone a large complicated dam. So Soviet engineers, Guinean technicians realized that uh, uh, even just getting there uh, was very difficult. Uh, there were no viable communication routes. Uh, the forest could be nearly impenetrable at times. Uh, there were very few existing roads and they tended to be usable only for about half a year during the dry season. Uh, during the rainy season, uh, the area would be prone to landslides, uh, flooding, and so yeah. on. So bringing the necessary equipment about large, expensive, complicated, heavy machines for construction was going to be a nightmare and especially uh, very, very expensive. Um, even after scaling down the size uh, of the project, uh, so scaling down the dam to something a lot smaller than what they had initially anticipated, so only 450,000 kilowatts, I think that the dam at Bratsk in the Soviet Union, uh, well, that produced four and a half million kilowatts, so 10 times smaller than that. Um, even that entailed very high costs. Uh, and after a couple of years of drafting and redrafting uh, projects, uh, the Soviet specialists in Moscow concluded that it was going to cost no less than 300 million ruble, uh, dollars sorry, to build a dam, um, and it was going to take no less than two years. That was a very optimistic uh, uh, estimate. Now, $300 million uh, was twice the amount of money that the Soviet government had promised um, Guinea. And people in Moscow were not happy with that at all. Uh, the time in which uh, part of the Soviet leadership was already questioning the wisdom 
was investing uh, in a place like West Africa, the Conquer Ray Dam appears like an extravagant project that neither country could afford. And the project was essentially shelled. Okay, whenever Guinean representatives asked their colleagues in the Soviet Union what's happening with the dam, they would be given the same answer. It's under study in Moscow. It remained under study forever. Uh, uh, the dam was never built. Uh, there is a dam today in Guinea, roughly in that spot. Uh, it was built uh, by an Italian construction company called Fregilo uh, in 1999. Uh, it took them nearly 20 years to build it. And it has a power of uh, 7,500 kilowatts, uh, which is less than a fifth of the Soviet uh, project. So it wasn't easy. A similar pattern, sort of high hopes, followed by disappointment, uh, took place in Mali and in Ghana as well. So I'll turn to Mali now and to my sort of second example. Uh, as you can see from the map, uh, Mali is a landlocked country. It does not have direct access to the sea. Uh, and this, of course, created problems uh, to the new independent government of, of Mali because, like Guinea, Mali needed to obtain from abroad most sort of basic goods and commodities necessary for economic survival at the time. Uh, traditionally, during the French colonial era, uh, Mali uh, uh, obtained its supplies uh, through the port of Dakar, Senegal to the west, uh, or through the port of Abidjan uh, in Cote d'Ivoire to the, the south. But in the 1960s, both Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire uh, uh, had remained sort of close allies of, of France. Uh, whereas Mali had chosen a very different approach, uh, becoming friendly with the Soviet Union. And so Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire had very little interest in letting Mali use its uh, uh, their port facilities. So Mali needed new, a new way to access the sea shipping lanes. Uh, and once again, the Soviet Union uh, was ready to, to help uh, in the context of the economic cooperation agreement Two countries signed in '61. On paper, the solution appeared relatively straightforward. Uh, Mali would be linked up with Guinea, which did have access to the sea, and crucially, it shared the same sort of socialist orientation as as Mali. So the two countries could be friends, could work together. Um, here are two the uh, that's Bamako, the, the capital of Mali. Um, here too, the, the dominant idea was the search for economic independence, uh, making Mali and Guinea to able to trade with other countries uh, and bring in what they needed without being too reliant uh, on the facilities of other potentially hostile states. And so Soviet and Malian, Guinean engineers, they drafted a fairly simple plan. Uh, they, they were going to build a railway to link up Bamako, the capital of Mali, with Kankan, uh, Guinea, and then from there to Conakry, which has access uh, to the sea. Moreover, the Soviet plan uh, was to make part of the river Niger uh, navigable. Once again, it doesn't exactly look like that. It's a, it's a very uh, uh, sort of basic uh, 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 rendition uh, of the river Niger and its, uh, its course. Um, so the idea was to, to make the river navigable, to be able to bring, uh, to reach the north of Mali with barges, to carry goods and commodities uh, to, to places like Bokti, Timbuktu, and, and Gao. On paper, this was a perfectly logical project to undertake. Mali needed access to the sea uh, uh, and also poor connections between the south of Mali and the north of Mali historically had been a source of tension in the, in the country. And the north was a lot poorer than the south and, and poor connections were one of the possible reasons for that. 
But like in Guinea, realizing this ambitious transport infrastructure project in practice proved a lot more complicated. There are about uh, 1,000 kilometers between uh, Bamako and Conakry. That's uh, roughly the same distance between New York City and Detroit. Uh, only in this part of West Africa, uh, this distance is covered in forest that's prone to flooding during the rainy season. Uh, it's another 1,000 kilometers from Bamako to Timbuktu in the north, navigating one of West Africa's uh, most uh, notoriously unpredictable rivers. And so things got out of control pretty quickly. Uh, building a railway was very difficult. Uh, it was a catch-22 situation. Uh, all construction material and construction equipment had to be brought from the Soviet Union uh, to, to sort of building sites uh, in the region. But how to transport heavy equipment uh, and materials uh, through forests and mountains? That's when Soviet Union Malian engineers realized that to build a railway, you need a road, and to build a road, you need a railway, and they had neither. Um, making the river navigable was possibly even more difficult. Uh, the north of Mali is certainly a, a challenging environment uh, in which to build. To give you an example, the very first uh, Soviet uh, team of engineers uh, 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 was sent to, the, to Timbuktu to survey the soil. Well, the aircraft crashed uh, because a very poor radio connection uh, to, to the sort of airport, and they all died, uh, which delayed uh, construction by almost a year. It became very difficult to recruit people uh, able and willing to work in a challenging uh, type of environment. But besides technical difficulties, once again, money was probably the uh, most difficult uh, problem for everyone. That the railway river project involved three governments, USSR, Bini, and, and Mali. As the costs of construction kept increasing and increasing, none of the three governments was willing to sort of pick up the extra expenses. Uh, in early 1963, about a, after about a year and a half of painfully slow progress on the project, both uh, Mali and Guinea announced that they had run out of money. Uh, the budget that they had assigned to the project had run out, and they expected the Soviet government uh, to sort of finance the fund uh, whatever extra expenses uh, were. But the Soviet answer was negative. Uh, the Soviet government was not going to pay for the railway for the river project by, by itself. The project was abandoned, uh, less than half of the railway completed. Uh, in 2015, years ago, I, I was in Mali myself for research, and, and the Bamako government was still looking for potential sponsors uh, to complete the second part of the railway. Uh, the river Niger remains largely impossible to, to, to navigate uh, with anything sort of larger than a small boat uh, to this day. So once again, high hopes followed by disappointment. Uh, time to turn to the, to the third and last uh, project I'd like to discuss with you, which is about agriculture uh, in, in Ghana. Uh, now, Ghana, at the moment of independence in 1957, was a very different country uh, from both uh, Mali and Guinea. Uh, for, uh, for once, it was uh, uh, it had a much more prosperous economy. It was considered uh, one of the wealthiest uh, countries in the region, and it was also a polytheist society in which multiple visions, views of development and economic management coexisted and often clashed. Uh, so the Soviet approach was certainly not the only one uh, that the Ghanaian government took into account. So Ghana had very different economic needs compared to Guinea and Jamali. The basic problem that the country had was agriculture. Uh, while it was, a, it was a relatively prosperous economy, uh, 
Ghanaian agriculture at the time still did not produce enough to feed the population. Uh, most basic food commodities had to be imported uh, from outside, from Europe. The main reason for that was that uh, during the, the colonial era, uh, Ghana was a monoculture. Uh, the, the Gold Coast, as, as Ghana was called, uh, as a British colony, it was used to grow uh, cocoa beans uh, uh, for British uh, chocolate makers. And after independence, Ghana remained a very major uh, producer of cocoa beans, uh, but its agriculture grew relatively little else. Uh, the government had to use the revenue from the sale of cocoa beans to purchase food uh, from outside. Um, and Krumah was unhappy about this situation. Uh, that the price of cocoa was believed to be declining at the time, and Ghana certainly did not control it. Uh, so being dependent on the price of the commodity uh, that moved on control, well, that can create problems. That's why in 1960, uh, uh, the government of Ghana and the Soviet Union, they signed a large-scale cooperation agreement, a protocol for the creation of collective and state farms in the country with the objective of boosting agricultural productivity production uh, away uh, outside of, of Coco. Uh, the Soviet government would finance the creation of a number of relatively small collective farms. You see them here on the map, roughly in the, in the right place, more or less. Uh, uh, they would focus on basic uh, 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 products, uh, timber for construction, grain, uh, fishing cooperatives, coast, uh, dairy farms, and so on. Besides uh, uh, the, the relatively small uh, uh, collective farms, the Soviet Union also committed uh, to creating three very, very large state farms uh, that would be entirely under the control of the, of the Ghana government. Uh, um, and they would be built exploiting the sort of flat plains of the, the Volta River. Once again, it doesn't exactly look like that, but, uh, but uh, you know, it's to give you a rough idea. Uh, that's, that's where the, the farms, this is obviously not the scale, but that's roughly where, where the farms would be built. Uh, two of them would focus on a uh, brain and one on corn, of course, an obsession of uh, push off. Um, so once again, uh, third time, economic independence uh, was at the basis of the core of the Soviet Ghanaian project. Uh, the idea was to focus on the cultivation of basic crops uh, for food production. Uh, so food would no longer need to be imported. And crucially, the government, thanks to the state farms, would be in control of the prices of basic agricultural products. The USSR would provide uh, the funding and also technical expertise to create the farms, provide the necessary equipment to run them, so seeds, tools, tractors, and so on. Uh, it would build accommodation facilities for the, for the workers. And he also promised to train both uh, Ghanaian workers and Ghanaian managers um, so that they would be able to run the farms by themselves. As in the other cases, uh, problems started, uh, well, relatively soon. Uh, building the farms proved a lot more expensive. There were logistical difficulties, but in this case, the projects did go ahead. And, and some of the farms were actually realized in practice and they started working. The problem was their management. The Soviet sort of training plan uh, uh, was to, was to well, build the factories, deliver the necessary equipment, run a few training workshops in Accra with their Ghanaian colleagues, and then leave. The Ghanaian side complained that they didn't have a huge experience uh, in, in growing crops other than cocoa beans, uh, and the training they had been given was inadequate. Uh, they needed more time to be able to organize the process, manage the equipment, uh, organize the workers, and so on. 
they didn't think they had received nearly enough uh, uh, preparation instruction from the Soviet side. And so in early 1962, the, the government of Ghana asked, demanded uh, that Soviet managers stay in the country for at least a year uh, to allow the Ghanaian Ministry of Agriculture to sort of develop uh, enough expertise to be able to take over uh, the running of the state farms by, by itself. But the problem was uh, who was going to pay uh, for the relatively expensive salaries of Soviet specialized agronomists and agricultural managers. Uh, the Ghanaian government expected the Soviet Union to pay. The Soviet Union had no intention of, of doing so. The two governments entered very lengthy negotiations, trying to reduce the costs at mounting farm. But after two years, they got no. Uh, by the time Khrushchev was ousted from power in late 1964, uh, the state farms had stopped working uh, uh, and they ended up being abandoned. Now, the trajectory of these three projects, I hope, disappointment, it mirrored uh, that of Soviet West African Economic Corporation in general. Um, well, first of all, there were changes in government. As I mentioned, uh, Khrushchev was ousted in 1964, and Kruma was also ousted in the military coup in 1966. And Bodibo Kita, Mali, was also ousted in the military coup in 1968. Uh, Sector Way remained in power until, until the late 80s, but his commitment to sort of socialism wavered. Uh, he realigned the country, sometimes with the US, sometimes with China, sometimes with the Soviet Union, sometimes with all three uh, at, at once. Um, so by the end of the 1960s, at the latest, there was very little visible trace of Soviet West African Economic Corporation. Um, let me give you a couple of uh, uh, sort of conclusive remarks before ending. Now, first, what the Soviet Union aimed to build in Ghana and Guinea, Mali, uh, in 1957, was certainly not communist and certainly not the Soviet style of communism. The Soviet objective was the creation of what they called a large state sector in the economies of the region, uh, based on public investment, infrastructure, agriculture, and some elements of industry. Uh, the creation of this large state sector uh, uh, is to make the local governments uh, uh, more in control, their economies, and less dependent on the changes from with the outside world. So rather than uh, forced collectivization and, and industrialization, which is the textbook Soviet model from the 30s, the Soviet approach in West Africa resembled a lot more uh, classic import substitution development strategy. Uh, reducing imports required the establishment of the form of state capitalism in West Africa. The end goal was the creation of an economic system very much dominated by the state, by the public sector, but in which very significant elements of the market, private sector, uh, remained and could even thrive under certain circumstances. So one of the central arguments of the, of the book um, is that the Soviet Union should be seen as a pioneer of the developmental state in the second half of the 20th century, not so much for its domestic economy, but for attempts at development cooperation, economic cooperation abroad, like the one in East Africa. At the same time, the Soviet approach to economic development um, abroad was also distinctly socialist. Uh, this was not necessarily because of the type the projects that the Soviet government became involved in. Dams, transport infrastructure, farming, etc. they're not inherently socialist in themselves. Uh, indeed, Western governments and international organizations have sponsored comparable, if not identical, uh, projects worldwide at the same time. 
What was different in the Soviet case uh, was the determination to design every project in public and collectivist terms. Dams, railways, farms on the surface may look like any other dam or railway or farm, but in Soviet plans, they had to be financed through public investment rather than the private sector, and they had to be controlled and managed by collective bodies. So the national government, in case of large projects and cooperatives of people, individuals, in the case of smaller scale projects. This was not a trivial difference. This is important, uh, uh, especially because it mattered to the governments of Ghana, Guinea, and Mali. For a decade or so, the ruling elites of these countries believed that the socialist approach was the best one. But relying on public investment and collective management uh, was superior than relying on private uh, investors and for profit enterprises. Now, whether right or wrong, that's something we can discuss for a very long time. Uh, but that was something that Pruma, Sekitore, and Kita uh, believed in. So I've discussed some of the aspects, the main aspects of the book, uh, and I'd be delighted to talk some more with you today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to questions and comments. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you so much. That was super informative. So we're going to open the comments and discussion. <laughs> there seems to be, yeah. <laughs> so let's start from question and then maybe. Uh, thank you very much. So I, I'm i curious about the title of the book, Progressive Book. How does how do you listen to this narrative? Secondly, why spe specifically Mali, Ghana, why? Yeah, yeah. So should I should I take it one by one? Yeah. 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 One by one. Yep. That's a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, the title, I mean, the title is a pun, of course, but but there is a there is a logic uh, uh, behind it. Uh, I mean, the process was interactive, right? I mean, you know, whether it's successful or, or, or not, whether right or wrong, that's something that sort of was happening. Uh, uh, but it was interactive, and and it was not interactive because of. Uh, um, something happened but because of people's will uh, uh, that's why i think the idea of arresting something suggests that you know there is an individual or a group of individuals that all of a sudden decide that that's no longer what they would like to do right so it suggests there's political will uh, which is maybe more important than so, you know, conditions on the ground and, and even money paid um, so that's that's where the title comes from um, as for the as for the why Ghana, Guinea, Mali, and not other places, there's there are two reasons. Uh, um, well, reason number one is that in the context of West Africa and, and the rest of the continent at the time, um, well, those were the only ones that developed ties to the Soviet Union. Uh, at the time, at least, I'm talking about 1950s, 1960s, and that's because they were the only ones that have radical enough governments uh, to be willing to experiment uh, with. with broadly speaking, socialist approach to the economy. Everyone else on the continent was either still a colony and therefore could not, uh, uh, even, if, even if they wanted, or took a very different uh, political and economic approach. Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, on, on a sort of outside of Africa on a more global scale, while those countries, uh, um, I think size is very important. Uh, um, they were relatively small in terms of population, in terms of economy, size of the economy, uh, uh, which means that even relatively limited in absolute terms, Soviet investments had a very large impact on the economies of these countries. Uh, if, you, if you compare them with very large countries that also had important, meaningful economic relations with the Soviet Union, India, Indonesia, Egypt, those were very, very large in terms of population, in terms of economy, in terms of geography too. Uh, so however large uh, Soviet investments were, they could never have the same impact as in a relatively small 
a country, society, place like Ghana, Mali. And, and I think that gives me <laughs> the possibility of studying the Soviet approach to development sort of at all levels. Uh, all the Soviet Union and Soviet people became so crucial uh, to the economic life of these countries in a way that was essentially impossible elsewhere in the, in the third world. Thank you so much. Uh, my question all the three countries were relatively independent countries at that time, and uh, especially France had uh, more intervention in its previous colonies. I was just wondering when Soviet Union decided to come in. Uh, in Ghana and Mali, how were the first world colonizers looking at it? And was there any intervention from their side to, uh, to make sure that the Soviet influence does not do in the region? That's another excellent question. Um, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, um, I don't even, I mean, Fr France and England were relatively similar. In, in their sort of willingness to maintain ties to, to their former colonies. Uh, maybe they did so in slightly different ways. So, so the French approach a bit more kind of blatant, uh, the, the English, British one a bit more sort of covered, uh, uh, but they aimed uh, at the same sort of end goal. Um, so I'll start from, from Ghana, which is the first one to become independent in 1957. It's the first uh, country in, in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, to become independent. Uh, uh, but I mean, the British presence is, is incredibly strong. Uh, um, that's an example I, I always use. Uh, um, so think that at the moment of independence, until at least 1960, 1961, the head of the Ghanaian armed forces, uh, the head of the police, the head of the central bank, uh, uh, and uh, um, the, the head of the uh, sort of economic planning uh, uh, ministry, they were all British people, white British men. Uh, uh, so, I mean, they were technically working for the, for the government of Ghana, uh, but they were citizens of a different country. Uh, and, and certainly from the Soviet point of view, uh, uh, they were defending the interests uh, of the former colonial power. Uh, uh, British sort of influence over the Ghanaian economy remained incredibly strong through that sort of cocoa trade, uh, uh, which was really dominated by British businesses. Uh, so, so, so there was little room for maneuver uh, uh, on, on, from the point of view of the newly independent uh, uh, government in, in Accra. Uh, uh, and, and, and it was very difficult for the Soviet Union to sort of, uh, uh, kind of break its system and, 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 and become uh, an actor economic actor in this context. Uh, the, the, the case of Mali and, and Guinea and of France is a little bit different because the break uh, in that case is a little bit more sudden and, and, and maybe clean. Uh, so <clears throat> Guinea became independent in 1958 following a referendum uh, in, in the whole of the French empire. Uh, and Guinea, this sort of tiny country in West Africa is the only uh, territory in this huge empire to vote no. Uh, uh, to the referendum, uh, to not want to stay part of the sort of French community. Uh, uh, and, the, and the French government reacts in a very harsh way. Uh, I mean, Guinea is essentially put under embargo. Uh, it can no longer trade with France and it cannot trade with the other uh, sort of former French colonies in the region, which means that it has no sort of economic lifeline. Uh, uh, it, it tries to uh, uh, sort of engage the U.S. government first, but the U.S. government is relatively uninterested in Guinea, and so the Soviet Union gains more and more traction um, in the country, not least because, I mean, the leadership of Guinea at the time uh, was very radical. These are, I mean, Sekou Toei for sure, but also other people, uh, they had a background in, in, in uh, the trade union movement. Uh, um, so, so they sort of appreciated a certain kind of collective display of things. Um, Mali follows a similar pattern. I mean, it stays, let's say, friendlier with France for, for a little while, but eventually decides to sort of break uh, uh, and, and, and look more um, at the society. 
um, in terms of sorry, it's, it's a long it's a long answer. In terms of reaction to sort of once the Soviet Union does establish uh, presence, people are very worried in Paris and in London. Uh, um, but these are also kind of broke European powers, and there's very little uh, they can do in practice uh, because they don't have I mean, they cannot finance uh, the, the same type of projects that the Soviet Union at the very least promises uh, to be able to sponsor. Uh, and so what they do is they do the kind of classic Cold War move of, of trying to get the US government involved, saying, well, you know, if, if you guys don't come in and, and, and sort of shower them with money, they'll become communists, right? Uh, uh, it doesn't really work, uh, uh, but that's basically the, the approach they, they take, yeah. Uh, I think you and then you, but yeah, <laughs> it was almost at the same time. Thank you so much. My name is Maxim. Uh, so uh, I just want to ask you to clarify to what extent this activity of Soviet Union uh, is grasped for the development influenced the economic development in these countries uh, as a whole and to what period of time? And could we say that uh, it was some, I don't know, some, some end of such like rules of development as new uh, stages of or like new times of development. That's a that's a very very good and very difficult question to answer. Um, Soviet engagement has certainly has an impact, uh, uh, and, and I mean it's complicated to assess positive, negative, very difficult. Uh, um, I mean part of it. I, I think I, it certainly sets in motion a number of processes that continue over time. Uh, governments change, uh, political outlooks change, but certain ideas remain uh, sort of in place to, to this day, uh, right? So, so that's, uh, there is something there. However, I think it's difficult to, uh, uh, um, I don't know, deny uh, um, that, that, that cooperation with the Soviet Union also had a very negative impact, at least on these economies because they became very, very reliant uh, on changes uh, and, and, and collaboration with the USSR. But once the Soviet government is less uh, sort of forthcoming, uh, well, that generates a number of problems. I mean, th these projects are very expensive. All three countries spend a lot on them. Uh, inflation becomes an issue for all three of them. Uh, uh, they have to sort of uh, adopt uh, fairly sort of harsh measures again that I mean that, that, that has a very uh, a significant impact on living standards um, of, the, of the populations. Uh, uh, um, so, so it's really a tale of two sort of sides in terms of inspiration, ideas, kind of the big picture, there is, there is certainly uh, something that continues uh, as I think as I think you were saying. but, but, at, but at the more kind of granular level that the day-to-day, running of, of governments and economies, well, that becomes very complicated and all, all three of them uh, sort of suffer uh, as a consequence of sort of the process being arrested or you know, frozen, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You're very welcome. Yeah. Thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. Um, so I, I noticed that in all three of the case studies, you highlighted uh, a similar trajectory for each of the case studies, right? There's this over-promising and, you know, maybe overcommitments of funding or over or underestimation of how much things will actually cost, the lack of contextual knowledge on the ground. And these are things that I would say haven't left the world of development, no matter who is running it. So I'm just curious if you would have, uh, if there were a couple of lessons learned that you would draw from these case studies specifically that are maybe not represented in all of development there, if there's something that you would say is the major takeaway for it development projects to learn from today? That's, a, that's another very tricky question. Very good, very tricky. Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, that, that, that trend is in, in part of development for sure. But I mean, I go, I would go even, even beyond that and say, you know, from my home renovation to, you know, building the panel here in Boston, you, you, you start with sort of one estimate of the project and it's always something like, oh, you know, it's going to be fine. A couple of years, it's not going to cost that much. And, you know, five years later, uh, you're facing a bill that's like three, four times as much. And, you know, there is no end in sight and so on and so forth, right? Every country in the war, in every city, every society, every individual, perhaps. I mean, you know, this is a problem that, that we all we all face, right? Construction creation is complicated, it's expensive, it's very difficult to predict. Soviet people, West African people, that 
it was not sort of unique to, to them uh, facing this type of problems, right? I'm I'm a little bit wary to, to talk about sort of lessons uh, for, for today. I mean, I don't think necessarily there is sort of much uh, much to learn. Uh, um, I mean, development is controversial, contested category uh, full of sort of evils, right? Uh, uh, so, so, so there is that. I mean, in general, I would say that any any economic enterprise, including including the pursuit of development, economic modernization, call it as we want. I mean, it fundamentally rests on political will. Uh, I mean, money is a, is a political concept. Uh, what, what, what's high cost? Uh, I mean, it depends on you know what what you expect to to gain at the end. Uh, and that's a political choice. Uh, uh, so if you believe in the end goal, sort of no cost is too high, no effort is too, is too difficult. Uh, 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 if you start doubting that, if you sort of rest the process, well, then, you know, it becomes unsustainable, right? Uh, uh, and given, given the amount of time that some of these very ambitious projects back then as, as today require, it's not easy to keep sort of political preferences consistent as it, as it, as it is maybe natural uh, to be because ideas, ideas change, right? Uh, uh, so I don't, I don't think I have a, I have a good answer, uh, uh, but at least being conscious of the uh, uh, sort of how political, uh, how dependent on, on political preferences, the concept and, and the practice uh, of development is, well, that can be a starting point. I think your story was, was most lacking in political will. You had to do some blame to me. Yeah. That's a very good, that's a very good question. I mean, I think, you know, the short answer is the Soviet government, eventually. Uh, it's the, the trajectory is there. I mean, you know, it's a classic of the Bushel era, right? I mean, great expectations, high hopes, something goes wrong. Uh, you take you take the opposite approach. I mean, it's not just in in the world of you know cooperation with the outside world. I mean, you can find plenty of traces of that in other areas too, right? Uh, so 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 definitely, I would identify uh, you know people in Moscow, the Kremlin leadership, uh, as as the the, the main skeptics. Uh, some were skeptics from day one. Some became sort of more and more skeptical. Uh, 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 I mean, not least because, I mean, you know, the, the Soviet Union, uh, uh, space race and dams and high growth rates, but, but it remains fundamentally a sort of mid-sized economy, middle-income economy, and, 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 you know, for, for a country of that size and that level of sort of economic power, I mean, you know, supporting uh, ambitious projects around the world is not an easy thing to do. It's easy to lose sort of confidence in, in that, right? Uh, the governments in, in West Africa uh, and, and maybe the people more in general, uh, I, I mean, whether or not their visions exactly corresponded is, is a matter of debate. I mean, in a way, perhaps uh, uh, people in a crime, Bamako and Conakry, they started off as uh, uh, even more believers in socialism, in traditional socialism, than, than, than sort of people in Moscow, right? I mean, in the book, I use a, a Sort of partly inappropriate, perhaps metaphor, but you know, I say that many people in West Africa they expected a five-year plan, and they were given they were given a new economic policy. Uh, but many expected really sort of that same process of incredibly fast uh, uh, industrialization. And that's not what sort of Soviet advisors were recommending. As a consequence, they also start to question uh, the, the, the wisdom of. Uh, continuing to be involved in cooperation with the society. Um, but yeah, that's the that's the rough, that's the rough speech, sure. Yeah, it's complicated for sure. Yeah, yeah I think Rachel. Um, and so it was so interesting. I was curious, I mean this is a very um a story of kind of disappointment that you're telling. And I was curious whether you see education as a form of development and <clears throat> how, I mean, the Soviets are also like they built the um, Polytechnic Institute, I believe in Mali, with, like the Pol Normal Superior, which is supposed to train teachers. I'm not sure if they built anything on that specifically, but they're certainly sending you know, lots of teachers. And then, of course, 
they're you know, giving scholarships to lots of students. And so I was just kind of curious whether you see education as a form of development, whether you think the Soviets did, and how that kind of fits into the story you're telling, um, especially something like the Polytechnic Institute, which is partly training engineers, which I imagine sort of fits into that story of self-reliance and you know, transitioning eventually to how cadres, you know, take over these projects. Um, so I just wonder if you Fantastic question. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, again, you know, development, they, they certainly, uh, um, it was certainly regarded uh, as, as part uh, of the sort of development effort, uh, building, uh, um, yeah, education, building culture, uh, and national culture uh, as a way, uh, essential a pillar of independence and also sort of development, speaking, um, certainly in West Africa and certainly in, in the Soviet Union too. Um, and it's absolutely right. I mean, they do build, yeah, polytechnic institutes in, in all three, actually, uh, uh, following roughly the same sort of model uh, with, some, with some differences, but the idea is, is sort of the same, which is, yeah, as you say, um, this is a, it's a technical institution that will eventually allow these countries to train sort of their own and peers and specialists and so on. Uh, uh, so again, pretty uh, sort of logical on the, on the surface. I have to say, however, that that, um, that was the theory uh, and perhaps the intention, um, but the practice uh, was lacking, uh, uh, at least in this moment in time and, uh, and uh, uh, um, in, in this decade. Construction always came first, the things you could touch, the tangible aspects. Uh, they always took precedence in terms of priority, in terms of money, in terms of resources assigned. Uh, uh, um, and maybe that was the tragedy uh, of, the, of the whole project, uh, uh, that sort of intangible abstract aspect was perhaps as important, if not more. Um, that's actually something I'm, I'm uh, going to investigate hopefully a bit more in detail, uh, the sort of intangible dimension of not just this relationship, but sort of uh, the Soviet Union's relationship with countries in her world in the end of the South. Fundamentally, I, I think that the reason why it received in practice a little bit less uh, 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 of a priority was because, well, people in the Soviet Union regarded uh, people in West Africa as not quite able to sort of get it. Uh, maybe maybe a polytechnic institute, uh, but not Pushkin, right? Uh, or, you know, only to a certain extent, uh, uh, not to the full extent. I mean, these were not equal. I mean, it was not an equal partnership. And, and, and to build something in, the, in a word of education, culture, intellectual exchanges, and so on, uh, uh, that, that's a more important requirement, right? Uh, uh, so basically, what I, what I would like to sort of investigate a bit more is, is whether it was a, was a colonial relationship, right? Uh, including including the, the sort of intangible aspects of sort of cultural um, cooperation and also also cooperation in uh, fields such as uh, sort of healthcare um, and kind of day to day factory work, right? Uh, so yeah. So I hope to have a better answer in a little while. But that's a great yeah that's a great question. I'm curious how you got the kind of inspiration for for the project and for the book. Yeah, that's uh, that's another that's another good one. Uh, it, it's a long story. Uh, I mean, I like traveling, and you know, I, I calculated that I was going to be able to go to lots of different places. That's that's certainly there. Uh, but you know, I started as a um, sort of very traditional. Uh, you know, I was interested in diplomatic history, right? Uh, uh, um, government, soldiers, spies, uh, that, that 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 kind of thing. Uh, um, but, but looking at, I mean, doing research in archives in Moscow and other places, like, I realized that what these people were talking about was development. Uh, and I have a, I have a background in, in economics and, and specifically sort of what at the time, you know, I'm an old person back in the 90s, development economics was a big thing, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, or they were talking in terms that were very familiar to me as a, as a by then sort of old student of, of that kind of that kind of thing. Uh, and sort of that clicked. Uh, and, and I decided that, yeah, I mean, that's actually the important part of the story. Uh, the war, it's, it's not about 
I mean, not only about sort of foods and revolutions and war, it's, it's about building um, education uh, uh, and, and development. Uh, and that's, that's how the book was born. Yeah. I, think, I think maybe here first, because yeah, it would be your number to, to, to for equality. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, you just mentioned in the previous question that it looks a little colonial. The Soviets building things. And I wanted to ask from the perspectives of the people in Ghana, Guinea, and Mali, seeing the French and the British leave, and then a short time later now, the Soviets are building things. Was there a lot of suspicion about the intentions? Was there suspicion of, of colonialism or imperialism on the Soviets' part? That's a great question. It, it, it doesn't look a little colonial, it looks very colonial, say, <laughs> which doesn't mean that it is. Uh, I mean, empire is complicated, right? Uh, uh, was it colonial? Was it not? I mean, is this about economic exploitation? Well, not at all. Uh, I mean, the Soviet Union lost a lot of money uh, rather than sort of gained. But then that was the case of France and England in sort of the late colonial period, just as much, right? Uh, so, you know, what's, what's an empire about, right? I mean, I think the answer to that question is more in what Rachel was uh, um, talking about a little while ago, right? It's, it's an order culture. You know, you go, you go to Ghana today, and most people, not all, but most people would say, that, you know, Shakespeare is like the greatest writer that ever existed, and the Premier League is the greater football or soccer league that, that there is. Uh, you, you move to Mali and, and Guinea, and, and people talk about Molière and Racine and, and, and you know, Mbappé and, 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 and French football, right? Uh, uh, no one will talk about Pushkin, uh, 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 right? Uh, and, and it's not just in West Africa, even, even in Cuba, uh, people talk about Cervantes much more than they talk about Pushkin, right? Uh, so is there a Soviet empire in places like Cuba, in places like Guinea or Bali, in places like I don't know, India, Indonesia? I, I don't know. Uh, uh, that's what I would like to sort of maybe not find out, but think about uh, for, the, for the next 10 years or so. Uh, uh, but, but, the reaction on the ground in, uh, in West Africa, uh, well, some people for sure uh, were very unhappy uh, with seeing that sort of happening. Uh, uh, George Patmore uh, uh, was very leading, an Africanist. It was uh, one of the most important advisors and personal friends of, of, of uh, uh, from uh, uh, and, and also someone who had a direct experience of the Soviet Union in the 1930s, right? Uh, uh, well, he, he, he really argued that, you know, Ghana should be very careful not to enter a colonial relationship with this new uh, sort of white imperialist power. And many people were, were sort of agreed with him, right? Uh, not, not everyone, though. Uh, there was interest uh, and, and uh, fascination uh, with the so, so Union, Soviet people, Soviet things. Uh, there were contested politics. Uh, very much so Ghana, in which uh, sort of, uh, the political left and the political right uh, were quite clear who to uh, identify, and they had very different different ideas about cooperation with the USSR. <laughs> Mali and Guinea, there were maybe, maybe more generally on board with the idea for a while, at least. I mean, not least for the way in which they had become independent. Uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, anger at the French Empire was certainly more sort of prominent than, than in Ghana toward the British Empire. And so building partnership with fundamentally an enemy uh, of the French Empire, well, that was, that was welcome uh, for a while. But things became complicated, especially uh, uh, because a lot of people uh, from West Africa went to the Union to study, to work. I mean, they faced racist, discrimination, violence very often. Um, Soviet people work uh, in the region. They also, you know, could be uh, pretty, pretty terrible. Uh, and so that relationship sort of soured. Relative. Yeah, that's a little bit of a Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I forgot about it. Just very briefly, um, I'm curious, uh, could you say that it was at the time kind of a, a, some sort of competition between different actors for this territory? I mean, economical or political competition, 
and uh, or it was just like uh, one actor, one main actor. So he was interested in in, in his relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a, there was a lot of competition. Uh, different moments in time, different actors were more prominent. The USSR, I, I argue, for about a decade or, or fifteen years or so, fifty-five to sixty-eight, remains sort of the, the most important actor, uh, but by no means the only one. Uh, former colonial powers were very active. The US was very active, and also sort of the UN system, right? Or bank and, and, and different branches um, of, the, of the organization. Um, it was competition for sure in some cases, but a little bit of a strange type of competition. Um, I don't buy sort of the argument that, you know, these actors, uh, USSR, US, the World Bank, France, England, and so on, they were sort of replaceable, right? Uh, they were competing for the same thing. Uh, I mean, they proposed different approaches uh, and, and you went to one because you wanted a very specific thing. Uh, uh, you know, you went to the Americans if you wanted, you know, kind of a market-led, uh, a private sector-driven type of project. You went to the Soviet Union if you wanted a state-led, public investment, collective type of thing. Um, so you could end up with a dam or, or a railway, uh, but it would be a very different type of dam or, or railway. Uh, uh, so it was a combination of ideas before it was a combination of things, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys, feel free to grab whatever you want to drink, whatever. That was a great talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you came over. Yeah. I always, I always, it was, uh, we saw it really.